Walter Abbott. We go up Red Hill. You through the gate.
initially not knowing exactly where this was going to lead me, I knew one of the major areas of relevance of this in our historical experience is the so-called know-nothing period of the 1850s. More about the term in a few moments. And knowing that I would likely find these issues there to be a convenient departure point, so at the main hysterical, historical society, I started looking at newspapers in the Portland area and began to find references to, uh, and to developing conflict, tension, and ultimately violence in Ellsworth, Maine, the county seat of Hancock County. Uh, most of you Mainers would know generally the area, but about 28 miles the southeast of Bangor. Uh, and the episode came to deal in a controversy emerged in 1853 and 4 over a protest going on in Ellsworth against the long-term practice in Maine and in other areas of the Protestant King James Version of the Bible being read in school as part of an English text and at the time as part of opening day exercises. This had long been the occasion in much of the northeastern United States and some of the frontier areas. But in the 1840s, as you would know in general, just general knowledge here and there, the Irish potato famine had helped to trigger uh, a significant increase uh, in Irish Catholic immigration to the United States. Uh, indeed, going back in the 1820s and 30s, it had been a substantial amount already, so much so the point that, that Bangor, Maine, for example, one third of the people of Bangor had been born in Ireland in the middle 1830s. But the major surge of early immigration from Ireland comes in the, from the middle 1840s to 50s. Not just the Maine, but all of the country. And as part of that, there came a kind of a sense of, of Catholic, Irish Catholic pride and assertiveness, where previously there had tended to be a kind of deference and a kind of a low profile manner, not wanting to upset the preponderant uh, Protestant population in America. And within Maine, and, and in eastern Maine, one of the key figures in this revitalizing of kind of Catholic pride and resurgence, resurgence was a, a Jesuit missionary uh, from French part of Switzerland who had come over to the U.S. in 1848 uh, without the ability to speak a word of English and had immediately been sent to a station in the Indian island for the Penobscot Indians in Old Town. So rustic Maine with hardly any forms of easy transportation. The person could not speak English, let alone the Algonquin language of the, of the Penobscot Indians. His name was John Babs. Some of you in Maine would know that the Catholic high school in Bangor is named John Babs High School. And he would later be the first president of Boston College. Babs, a kind of young, a uh, studious, intellectually inclined person. People said he had a great resemblance to Ralph Waldo Emerson in physical manner and style. Uh, uh, initially, in this rustic surrounding, served as a missionary for the uh, Penobscot Indians, but eventually was transferred first to Eastport, where with four other missionaries, he traveled over much of the state of Maine at a time when Railroads were virtually non-existent in Maine, and travel otherwise was very slow. Eventually, he reported to his superior at the bishop in Boston uh, that, he, that there was a recommendation that two of them move to Ellsworth because it would be easier to travel from Ellsworth to western areas than it would be from the east port of Machias area. And so in 1852, he did. And Baps, Working out of Ellsworth, where he would return every week, and then as a missionary over part of the rest of Maine during the rest of the week, led a movement basically of assertiveness, calling for the right of, first, either no Bible reading at all in the schools, or if there was going to be Bible reading, then the Douay version, the Catholic version, should be available to Catholic, the youngsters. This became the tip of the iceberg of whole lots of different tensions that were developing as this rapid movement came in. And so basically, uh, this episode culminates in the most violent episode of the Know Nothing period, where Vaps on October 14th of 1854 was kidnapped, uh, uh, carried away, uh, uh, ridden on a rail and tarred and feathered and threatened with death if he ever returned to Ellsworth, October 14, 1854. So I was reading a lot of the newspaper accounts of this, 
uh, I began to dive in. This, this sounds like a fascinating type of thing to explore because th it's been mentioned in other areas, but not never really much in detail. And as I proceeded to study, I noted also that a key figure in this episode was the editor of the weekly newspaper in Ellsworth, a man name of William Cheney. Uh, Cheney, I would come to learn, had been born in, uh, in had, been, had been born in Chesterville. Uh, in 1821, uh, the same year that Maddox ultimately would be, in later life, in a checkered career that is a fascinating one and that I would come to study and ultimately write a, a book of just recently finished, uh, Cheney would be the father of Jack London, uh, the famous American author. If you read, if anyone reads any London biography, the first chapter will be a lot of this, this main, rather ambitious and, and, and uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, zealot and opportunist Cheney. So I got fascinated in it, started to draw it in and began to travel and look into this episode and in the process began to find an account here and there a reference to a man named George W. Maddox. Uh, and okay, that's fine and handy and I go on and as I came to study, greatly helped by a person who is now a retired Maine judge from Ellsworth, Herbert Silsby, He's been a great, he's been a president of the Maine Historical Society and a great a, a historian of Hancock County and very much a supporter of my, my work. Uh, I, I came to learn basically uh, from him that when the grand jury was impaneled to try to, uh, to investigate the people and find out who were the people who, who had been involved in the kidnapping and the assault upon Babs, the uh, grand jury uh, docket title is called the State versus G.W. Maddox et al. Uh, it turns out, uh, and so I mean Maddox has a certain claim to involvement in this uh, for the scurrilous activity. Okay, as the years go on, I, mean, I was I decided to write a biography of Cheney and uh, did a lot of the Elsa thing and began to move on. In in later uh, in the 1870s, Cheney in another part of his life. I became an itinerant lecturer out in the Pacific Northwest in California. And in the process, he went on to various uh, um, occult and social protest types of movements. He was a professional astrologer, and Cheney would develop <coughs> the rather bizarre belief that <coughs> in what was called, what he called astrotheology, basically that all the major modern religions were derived from ancient folk tales. Well, some whole parts of that today scholars do in parts. But Cheney went and followed other people into more bizarre backwater of the occult to the idea that those folk tales had been derived from ancient attempts to describe the movements of the heavens. So that Cheney would move throughout the Pacific Northwest, small towns, villages, and cities, preaching the idea basically that every character in the Bible is a constellation or a planet or is otherwise out of this world, as it were. Well, again, a rather bizarre fellow living by his wits until he dies in 1903. In Chesterville, I just noted today coming in <clears throat> that in the file upstairs of, of births, marriages, and deaths, uh, William H. Cheney's death is recorded up here in the far, from a Farmington newspaper in 1903, as it were. Well, the point is, finally, Although out west, Cheney would write letters, correspondence to various radical journals and the like. And I knew he was writing, so I started to look through them. And as I did, I began to come, come upon certain letters and articles signed Maddox of Maine. Now, George W. Maddox spelled his name M-A-D-O-X. Uh, to my mind, somewhat unusual. And so when it said Maddox of Maine, I began to wonder, gee, and I later found another journal that indeed it was George W. Maddox. So the genesis of this topic tonight, with its openly long title, is basically my curiosity that I've spent the last year and a half or so in trying to deal with. How did this guy who was perceived as a nativist, and I heard someone say, I've never heard about nativism, and traditionally nativism meaning anti-foreign or anti-foreign beliefs. How did this fellow who was a nativist in the 1850s, and therefore in the academy, in the university, I come home deploring of nativism, you know, anti-immigrant feeling, it's bad, it's, and it truly is. 
But then in the 1870s, uh, Maddox becomes a significant figure in the women's movement. He is, as I will see in a moment, he's the moderator at the convention that nominated the first woman candidate for president, Victoria Woodhull, in 1872. And Maddox would also become a significant leader when he moves to New York City in Karl Marx's International Working Men's Association, you know, the International, as it were. And a feisty guy with a powerful, booming voice who kept order. That was one reason why he's appointed. He also acquires the nickname the Mad Ox of Maine, as it were. <laughs> so the issue that, that drew me into this and, and causes my talk tonight, because I finally get virtually everything and within one, every footnote collected. So I wanted to try to bring my findings to people, uh, whether they want to hear it or not. Uh, the, the thing that I'm, I'm interested in the person in general, and I, I hope in you now 30 minutes or whatever we have left to try to convey a bit of that. But as a historian teaching courses at the University of Southern Maine, I'm, I'm also interested in how can this guy seemingly go from one point of view that seems so very different from another. And, and my belief, um, flawed as it may be, or tentative as it may be at least, is that there's a certain continuity in these movements and it somewhat grows out of his own background. So I know this is an openly long preamble, uh, but uh, this somewhat accounts for this, why this wretchedly long title that I, I asked Stan to publicize in certain ways, and some of you came in spite of the length of the title, and we'll see what we can do with it. So in the next minutes that survive of my, my talk, I want to try to uh, characterize this person and have you come to know him a bit, uh, and to perhaps understand a little bit of what brought him to some of the views that he did. And as I go, as I say, I welcome in or after the, the, the uh, the uh, presentation to, to respond to any questions that anybody has. Well, as, as I've alluded to before, uh, and it becomes important today, his name was George Washington Maddox. He was born in the last, someday in the last two weeks of December 1821, so eventually he will die at 60 years one month. But he's born, reared, and spends most of the first half of his uh, 30 years of his life, uh, in, in fact, most of the first 47 years of his 60 years in Ellsworth, or well, that's where his roots are. The, I don't know much about him in general, but I surmise first. The name George Washington Maddox conveys the idea that in his nurturing childhood, at least the sense here of respect for Washington and the early figures of our republic must have been a significant factor. Otherwise, why would you name him George Washington? You could name him George Bush or Bill Clinton or something like that. Uh, second bit of information that I know of is that he, uh, that he tends to be of what uh, one, one might call the, the craftsman or the small business uh, uh, entrepreneur, or really not an entrepreneur, but a shopkeeper. He was a wedge and plug uh, manufacturer in Ellsworth for ships. And he advertises as a, a, a bill by mail, the best and cheapest that you can buy in the state of Maine. Recognize that the Ellsworth of the 1820s to the 50s was just on the eve of embarking in its major period of growth. Even then, at its peak of about a population of 5,000 at the time of tonight's work, uh, it was about the 13th largest town in the state of Maine. But even on a small basis, it had grown relatively rapidly from the 1840s to the 1850s. So he's, he's a uh, craftsman, a watch, a, a wedge and, and plug maker for vessels. Ells, Ellsworth was a significant shipbuilding center and a port on the coastal shipping down the east coast. And it was also the center of a lumberman's trade. There was a lot of lumbering going on in, in forest products in the uh, Hancock and Washington County area. This community, 28 miles southeast of Bangor. Some of you may know Bangor in the 1840s and 50s was the largest uh, lumber exporting center in the world. In 1843, uh, he married uh, a Abigail Creighton. 
uh, in a Methodist ceremony in Bucksport, about 10 miles away from Ellsworth. So, uh, marrying in 1843, by 1853 and 4, the key period for me tonight, uh, they would have five children, three boys, two girls, and by 1860, uh, they have a family of nine children, five boys, four, uh, four girls. He comes to be a significant figure for me in history, and, it, and evidence begins to appear significantly for us in the 1852 period on, when, as I've alluded to, but will not try to be too repetitious, the controversy builds in Ellsworth uh, in tension between Protestants and Catholics. Uh, here, two dominant figures arise to serve as the polo leaders of their various camps. One, born at the end of 1815, so about 38 years old, rather scholarly, rather slight, was Father John Baps, a very devoted Jesuit, very intelligent, university educated, had been a scholar. <laughs> Uh, when in 1848 he was called to Paris and informed by his superior that he was being sent to America, he broke down in tears. He had no particular affection for America. He, he was very much a figure of the libraries and the universities of Europe, but a loyal figure he comes to the U.S. in 1848, and as I said, eventually he comes up here in May. He was a rather assertive figure in asserting that Catholic Americans should have the same rights as Protestants. This will cause him to be perceived by people on the Protestant or the non-Catholic side, many of them Ellsworth, as rocking the boat, as challenging the accepted conditions and traditions of Hancock County, and frankly much of America then. The key figure on the other side leading the way by his newspaper and by his <coughs> rallies and by his speaking was William Cheney, born in Chesterfield, Chesterville here in Maine, who had basically, in a rather bizarre life, traveled to Vir Virginia and then to Iowa and, and traveled around and had come back to Ellsworth in his early 30s, had struggled in the law and become a newspaper editor. Well, ultimately, the, the issue that triggers this dispute, again, is the issue of the reading of, the, of the, 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 the Protestant King James Version of the Bible in the schools. In the autumn of 1853, <clears throat> the priest, uh, Father Baps, got a petition together after he had been unable to be uh, to have his views accepted by the superintendent, by the superintending board, the school board of, school, of education, and so the Catholic many of the Catholic community, several hundred at that time. Apparently, the population of Catholics then in Ellsworth is about 800 in a population of about 54 or 500, somewhere around 16, 17 percent, significant increase from what it had been before, and the petition was downturned by nativists on the school board and by newspaper criticism lambasting this uh, upsetting figure and prompting the school board members to go to the schools, particularly one school that was still open in the fall, others had closed, but the teacher had been ill. And so the result was the school was lasting a bit longer than the others and demanded that every child read the King James Version of the Bible. Sixteen children in the school refused to, and therefore they left, and the school board expelled them. Father Baps used the expulsion as the basis <coughs> for a court case. He persuaded the uh, Donahue family, new immigrants to Ellsworth, uh, whose daughter, uh, Bridget, at 16, was one of the students expelled, and her father, uh, uh, her, her father, Dennis Donahue, to bring court suits, uh, first the child and then the father of the child and then the father is a taxpayer for the fact that the students had been dismissed. This issue gradually worked its way up through the courts and, and in July, it was going to be, at the end of July, it was going to be heard by the, by the main state Supreme Court in Bangor. Prior to this time, violence had broken out in Ellsworth. The community is almost divided. 
a nativist, meaning kind of anti-Catholic uh, group of uh, old teenagers and men in the young 20s and 30s called the Cast Iron Band. Again, to basically march around the city and beat up Irish Catholics that they might meet, cause trouble, and, and so on. Violence between the two groups had built up. By June, uh, there were attacks against the priest's house sufficient for the bishop in Boston to transfer uh, Baps to Bangor, where there was a vacancy that was called St. Michael's Church, now St. John's Church. And so he was immediately transferred there. Well, the court case is pending, and this creates the setting for me here. On July 8th of 1854, a town meeting was called by a number of people petitioning the selectmen requiring a town meeting of me to raise money for, to help cover the expenses of the two school board uh, members who were going to face trial. And they were going to try to raise some $500 to achieve this, this, uh, this end. Well, the effect of this was to see the pinning of a series of resolutions. And basically, some conciliating figures who had come forward uh, had hoped to try to bring peace and to try to reconcile it. So they didn't have the votes in this 500 seating hall. So they left not knowing they didn't have the votes. So first, two resolutions were passed providing for raising $500 for this and so on uh, to, for the defense. But then George W. Maddox, who had become one of the people involved in these episodes, was handed by a fellow nativist uh, to uh, basically a, the following resolution which ultimately was then approved by everyone in attendance. So it's got to be at least by 270 or so, because people had left when they knew they weren't going to be influenced thing. So here was the motion that was unanimously adopted. Maddox being the figure turns it in. Whereas we have good reason to believe that we are indebted to one John Baps, S.J., Society of Jesus, Catholic priest for the luxury of the present lawsuit, now enjoyed by the school committee of Ellswood, therefore resolved that should the said Baps be found again upon Ellsworth soil, we manifest our gratitude for his kindly interference with our free schools and <laughs> attempts to banish the Holy Bible therefrom by procuring for him and trying on an entire suit of new clothes, <laughs> such as cannot be found at the shops of any tailor, and that when thus apparelled, he be presented with a free ticket to leave Ellsworth upon the first railroad office <laughs> operation that may go into effect. Again, unanimously endorsed. Maddox, by this time, had also become a participant in the Know Nothing organization, which was driving forward the nativists there. The term Know Nothing is spelled K-N-O-W, not N-O. And its origin would be in New York City in 1848. It was one of probably a couple dozen uh, small secret fraternities of basically the requirement being of Protestant natives of America, native-born people of America, who were upset by the increasing movement of non-Protestant immigrants to America. And so one was uh, one applied to join this, and joined through a very elaborate ceremony after one had been checked to make sure both parents were non-Catholic and both had been born in America. And so one would attend a particular meeting place and not the door come out, someone throw a paper bag or something around one's head, and they would carry you in for an elaborate initiation. The initiation in which your left hand would be put upon the Bible and a right hand pointing to a flag behind you. And you would promise, among other things, loyalty to the, uh, to the organization, which was called the Supreme Order of the Star Spangled Banner. That's kind of, you know, kind of patriotic little to it, you see. And you would promise, among other things, first, that you would be loyal to the movement, that you would never vote for any uh, candidate who was of Catholic background or who was supporting the church, you would also not patronize a business that did. And what was more, if you were asked about anything about your organization and you didn't know if the person was a member, 
you would say, I know nothing about it. That's the no. word, know nothing. A K-N-O-W comes from that. If, if you knew someone was in your particular secret fraternity and they'd say, you know, what time's our meeting? You know, then, then you would acknowledge it. But that's the term, know nothing. It spread all over the northeastern United States very rapidly. And in Ellsworth, William Cheney, the editor of the Ellsworth Herald, became a, the leading force in that. One more thought. The Know Nothing movement developed a political party called the American Party as a, as a movement expressing these kind of views. And no, and Cheney, the editor and publisher of the Ellsworth Herald, changed the name of his newspaper to the Ellsworth American. Mm -hmm. You may know that the Ellsworth American is a rather celebrated weekly newspaper in, in, in Maine, and its origin would be this Know Nothing movement. Now there's one more part fundamental to my work tonight, and that is Cheney and others, at least, I mean, I mean uh, George W. Maddox and others, at least Maddox, George Washington Maddox, uh, felt basically that American values and traditions going back to the revolutionary period were being undermined by events in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s that the movement even of immigrants from a different point of view were threatening to these values. In particular, Cheney was troubled by the way in which he felt that political leaders of the Democratic and of the Whig Party, business leaders, the elites, as he refers to them, people of the upper 10 percent, um, were basically working with this community of immigrants and thus underlying, undermining America. Note, in other words, George Washington Maddox's concerns are at least in part triggered by the idea that elites are selling America out. Well, as I mentioned in the time of fleeing, uh, the attack, Father Vax came back to Ellsworth on Saturday, October 14th. There are two explanations offered, different explanations, why does he come? One view was he was on his way to Southwest Harbor and Mount Desert Island. Else was about midway, good stopping point. The other one was uh, that he was coming back to see his old friends in Ellsworth. And so he stayed with the Richard Kent family there, a Catholic friends visited him. Uh, he presented a confessional to them and so on. And then on 9 o'clock on a driving Saturday evening, rainy night, uh, the house was surrounded by about 100 mass figures, and the Baptists hauled off, and the work done. <clears throat> Ten days later, on October the 24th, a Tuesday, <clears throat> the grand jury was beginning to meet. It was the date at which the, the state Supreme Court was going to be meeting in Ellsworth that day, just accidentally. And to Ellsworth came George Evans, the Attorney General of Maine, to present the case to the Supreme to the 16 members of the, of the grand jury. Earlier in the night before that meeting, a number of nativists <clears throat> had gathered and had all agreed that no one was to go to jail for assaulting Babs. And that if anyone was ever brought to jail, uh, the jail was going to be broken down. <clears throat> and so the, there were 16 members of the, of the uh, of the grand jury, uh, the attorney general uh, was a person who had been in a U.S. senator for 12 years. He'd been a member of the House of Representatives for eight. He was one of the leaders of the Whig Party. I, one of the best lawyers made and presented. He, he told people, this is about the strongest case I'll ever present. And I've ever presented it. Very confident. He goes in, and by a nine to seven vote, every one of the defendants was cleared in the case of Maine versus the state versus G.W. Maddox et al. Uh, rumor had it there were of the 16 members of the court, nine and uh, uh, the grand jury, nine were no nothings. And it was a nine to seven vote in each case. <clears throat> Interestingly, no further prosecution of any other allegedly guilty party was ever made. The case dropped. The, year, the next years go quickly for us uh, as uh, about 10 minutes to go. Uh, first, of all things, he begins to study law. And uh, Maddox becomes a lawyer admitted to the Hancock County Bar 
in October 1858 by the extraordinary practice of him nominating himself. The custom is that basically that, that a, a fellow lawyer or someone else trained or whoever would, would, would initiate you, you get somewhat of a sense of the perception of Maddox in the community when he was the only, he was the only person who was willing to present his name. Secondly, he becomes active in the abolitionist movement, the anti-slavery movement. He becomes genuinely committed to this. Significantly, some members of the Know Nothing movement had been as well. I found at least three letters written to William Lloyd Garrison, the controversial editor and publisher of The Liberator. He names a son born in 1855, Wendell Phillips Maddox. Wendell Phillips was a celebrated Boston abolitionist whose family traced its lineage back to the John Winthrop days in Massachusetts. And third, uh, 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 Maddox was a huge supporter of John Brown. When the famous uh, controversial abolitionist who had attacked Federal Fort in, uh, in uh, Harper's Ferry was captured, tried, and then executed, uh, Maddox draped black crepe all about his law office and, and claimed that, uh, that John Brown was the greatest Christian, including the founder of Christianity, that had ever lived. <laughs> Uh, at 42 years old, with nine children, although some grown, he enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1863 in December. Uh, rapidly trained, uh, joined the Army and elsewhere, shipped to Belfast, to Portland, and then down to Virginia where they, try, try, uh, where they, where they trained. And then on July 24th, uh, he and his group had made their way uh, by water to Virginia, land in Virginia, and then quickly overland that day to Spotsylvania, where on the 25th and 6th, the Battle of Spotsylvania, courthouse to take place, one of the major battles of the Civil War. 12 hours into his first combat duty, firing in the trenches, Maddox stands up to fire his rifle. As he does, he's hit. Uh, a bullet goes through the left shoulder, it merges to the right, his head is inclined for that point, the rest of his life forever forward. Initially, he's reported in the New York Herald Tribune as dying, so reported in the Ellsworth American, but uh, obviously uh, they corrected that within a matter of a couple days. Um, Maddox comes home to Maine, spends much of his time recovering in hospitals, first at Togus and Augusta, a little bit in Portland, and then back to to, uh, to Philadelphia and Washington for next year or two recovering. And then very, very significantly, in letters he writes to Yeltsin with America, he expresses his support and concern for improving the lot of the former black slaves. He indicates how war service has had a significant effect him, he says, on enlarging our sentiments, maybe in a sense declining some of his anti-Catholic views at the time and expressing a commitment to trying to make justice an important part of his life. He also, though, is not without self-assertiveness. He indicates he's going to run a year later to become clerk of the courts for Hancock County. And rather interesting, a Republican, Democrat are running. He says, my involvement in the race means that either the Democrat will win or I will running uh, because uh, basically the Republican and I are going to divide the votes. He said, I'm depending upon the votes of soldiers loyal to the cause. And he's very ambitious that he's going to win. Well, in Hancock County, the whole results aren't available in detail, but those of Ellsworth, about one-seventh were. And in Ellsworth, the result was such that the Republican got about 450 votes. The Democrat got about 440. And Cheney, and, and I'm sorry, and Maddox got seven. <laughs> it's a pretty good indication of what the people who know you best kind of think of you. Within a year, within a year, Maddox had decided that he must change his direction in his life. Leaving his wife and family at home, he sets out for New York City, where for most of the rest of his life, from 1869 to 1880, he spends his time living alone, coming back to visit his wife and family for usually about three or four weeks every two years. <clears throat> in, El in, in New York, he writes letters back to the Ellsworth American. First, among the letters, beyond expressing the fascination and the, the, the vitality of New York, 
Next thing he notices is the enormous gulf he finds between the rich and the poor. And his feeling that too many of the rich are idle, rejecting their Republican, I don't mean Republican heritage, but American revolutionary heritage of hard work and loyalty they cause. Instead, they're living the, an idle life and a life of high status, ignoring the poor and talking about the poverty that he sees in New York. He then also writes about the, the, the variety of peoples that he finds in New York, far greater than the homogeneous nature of Maine. <clears throat> and also about the developing prosperity he sees in housing. I get the suggestion that he starts to work already in the real estate business, and within a year in the New York City directories, He's working as an agent and a realtor. The re real estate brings him out in the community, gets to see things and the like. And whether it's the time he's got on his hands away from his family, the contacts he makes, or his genuine feelings, he is drawn in after 1870 and 71 into movements challenging traditional values in America. He joins in 1871, the IWA, the International Working Men's Association, which was Karl Marx's first international communist movement. And he becomes a significant figure in this movement, significantly joining what is called Section 12, of probably 35 or 40 in the country. Section 12 was almost completely American-born people in New York. Whereas the IWA, across the country, about 3,000 members, probably 40% were German immigrants, about 30% are French immigrants, about 10% are immigrants from Europe, other areas, about 20% are American. The 12th section was, was a movement of people supporting Marx's criticism of differences in, 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 in wealth and justice and so forth, but the significant point being non-doctrinal pragmatically saying, let's work through politics or work with any other group that we can. And active in that group also was Victoria Woodhull. <clears throat> George Maddox from then on becomes active through the 1870s in movements supporting the idea of the equality of women. He moves forward for a kind of attack upon traditional financial elites. To me, the continuing the linkage point here, as the know-nothings saw the Pope in Rome uh, providing a kind of direction of local Catholics and local financial, legal, and publishing elites were caving into them and betraying their Republican represented heritage. Maddox saw the same theme in the 1870s. He saw, from his view, uh, wealthy bankers who were in league with European bankers and business leaders and government kind of stuffing the American native tradition types. That to me is, is a fascination that he uses very similar arguments toward very different groups. <clears throat> One thing, however, that he was concerned about is punctuality, and I know that I'm pushing the envelope now. <laughs> Let me indicate in brief, uh, although there's more to be said, unfortunately, for me, but happily for you, we won't pursue it. But in 1879, his last trip back to Ellsworth, um, <clears throat> people with whom he spoke indicated that he was referring, that his health seemed to be declining. He made a comment to one of his friends. We know this from the pension records where people would testify and provide evidence for his condition. Uh, he said, that blasted Confederate bullet's going to bring me down. He'd been, his head had always kind of leaned forward, and he seemed to be leaning more than before. Uh, in 1880, he returns from Ellsworth and, for my mind, peculiarly, settles in Washington, D.C. My suspicion being, without having any evidence, that maybe a grown daughter, married daughter, or one of his sisters, if he had sisters, living in D.C. might provide homes so he could be treated at a medical hospital in Washington. I don't know whether that's the case or not. In any event, on February, in February of 1881, uh, February 1882, he dies in Washington from pneumonia complicated by pleurisy, 
uh, and with heart and, and heart problems and, and all. He's a fascinating figure, certainly not admirable in many ways. Uh, what fascinates me a bit is the reasoning that he used for joining movements that seem on the surface somewhat quite different. And uh, I, I know it's, it's a long evening and I don't want to pursue too much more, but I would be glad to respond to questions you might have. I've tried to hit my 40 to 45 minute deadline without being removed with a hook, so, uh, but I, I respond to any questions if anybody might have them. And so it was this chapter that Maddox joined. 
and he became very much a supporter of hers. And she ambitiously stated that she was going to run for president. And so in early May 1872, this the Equal Rights, uh, uh, the Equal Rights Convention is held in New York. Maddox becomes a central figure in it, Maddox of Maine, or as others call the Mad Ox of Maine. Uh, he is the moderator, the presiding officer at which the first woman candidate for president is picked. And the newspapers of New York, who didn't like any of them, seized upon Maddox because of his, his easy way to ridicule and the like. Uh, they, they portrayed his hands as, as almost like a piston as he moved around feverishly. He was the Maddox of Maine. They, er, they indicated he was kind of blustering and foaming at the mouth. He, he as a person, was about 5'8 and about 140 pounds. And uh, they, they saw this, this feisty little guy who, was, uh, who became an easy target on which to pick. So uh, ultimately, after about three months running, uh, and I should indicate, Victoria Woodhull chose Frederick Douglass, the famous African-American abolitionist, to be her running mate. Rather interestingly, because there was not one black person at the convention, Victoria Woodhull had never met Douglass. And when Douglas was informed that he had been named the vice presidential candidate, he refused to acknowledge it one way or the other. So he just kind of left it hanging, you know, as it were. And three months later, she had to give up not only her campaign, but her newspaper. This rather interestingly, all of a sudden at once, landlords, agents, business people, all of a sudden individually hit her one after another with huge increases in charges for it. It certainly seems a sort of conspiratorial work afoot. And, and uh, Maddox, as it turns out, was back home in Ellsworth on a visit at that time. And he's interviewed by the Ellsworth paper. And, and, and when she pulls out and throws her support behind Horace Greeley, the Democratic candidate, and Maddox says, well, I guess I'll support him, but not with much enthusiasm. <laughs> so uh, he, he was genuinely involved in the feminism of the, 90, of the 1870s. He defended Woodhull. Uh, in arguing that, the, from his view, the matters of justice uh, really required people to look at the bigger picture and not be put off by her free love practices and shortcomings that way. Uh, it is true. What, uh, how did the uh, main uh, Supreme Court rule on that? Uh, the Bible case? Yeah. OK. Uh, the, in in uh, early August, I think it is, in the Bangor papers particularly, they have the whole decision. It's in the court cases of Maine. Basically, and, and for a while, the Ellsworth decisions were guiding all over the country. But I, I don't have a date, but I'm saying maybe by the 1880s, other issues come up. So they're, today, not so significant. So what, and, and interestingly, supporting the state, uh, supporting the Ellsworth school board was Richard Henry Dana, you know, two years before the mass, and so he came up from Boston to argue the case for the uh, school board side, even though he wasn't particularly a, a nativist, but he was hired for that. Basically, the, the Supreme Court of Maine upheld the right of the school board to assign the Bible and designate the Bible for use in schools with the provision that contested parts uh, not be used within the, the, within the uh, schools, that if, if passages from the Bible that were not objectionable to people could, could be used. The school board had that authority as one of their responsibilities. But it, again, it, it does stipulate that if there's, if there's contested uh, criticism, then, then, and, then uh, it, it, they, don't, they, they don't justify that part of it. With his sure. Uh, were the students that were expelled were they, they were not reinstated? Uh, they, they were not reinstated uh, immediately, at least. Significantly, uh, again, this occurs in October, no, really November of 1853. In the beginning of December 1853, Ellsworth uh, develops the first uh, Catholic school in the state of Maine. Uh, and a lady by the name of, of Mary Agnes Tinker uh, T-I-N-C-K-E-R is, I think, her real name is, or was a family name. Uh, no, her family name is T-I-N-K-E-R, but she puts a C into it. And in a Dictionary of American Biography and other references, you can see references to her. 
She was one of the uh, one of the young women. Apparently, she graduated from what is before the dinner tonight. We were talking about the term, but somebody about the term normal school. She developed. I think she graduated from what might have been the Machias. Uh, uh, normal school, or at least some kind of teacher training school, and and uh, she converted to Catholicism, and she came to be the teacher for the cat in the Catholic school in Ellsworth. Uh, she later becomes a significant author, uh, writing generally, I guess, from what people say, a really bad novel. She's not very first class, but there's a very significant book she writes in 1871 or two. It's called The House of York. And it's a novel based on the Ellsworth Bible situation. Uh, and it seems to be rather true. There's an article on that book that was published in a, uh, in, in a journal talking about the House of York as a source for the Ellsworth Bible dispute. Uh, that book is not widely available, but Bangor Public Library, Boston Public, and the, Mains, and the University of Maine Library have copies of it. It's rather interesting. Uh, I've done a lot of work on the Ellsworth part of it, and I, I, as far as I can see, it, it, there's nothing that is that is basically uh, uh, contrary to what was there. And the, some of the characters are doing other things, like, but the but the interpretive part of that is, and it, it's kind of that's a significant book, really. Anything else? Yeah, I, just, I, yeah. just to follow up, this yeah, oh, sure. question, the Ellsworth, you said Ellsworth uh, created a Catholic school. Was yeah. There, was that created by the Catholics? Yeah, yeah I should have said that. Uh, the, the Catholic uh, parish uh, put forward the money. Uh, John Bapp's letters, I have, uh, there are a few at the Boston Archdiocese archives, but there are some others that were printed in the 1880s. And uh, he writes to his uh, to the bishop in Boston. Right? He's a Jesuit, so his, one of his superiors is a Jesuit order in Baltimore, and and, and the non-Jesuit uh, uh, bishop in Boston. And he writes saying basically that these relatively poor people are sacrificing to put the school forward. Now, just one other thought, a little bit as it comes to mind. Uh, as I've mentioned, in 1854, in June, he's transferred to Bangor and uh, to St. Michael's. In December 1854, the cornerstone is uh, laid uh, for the building of a new Catholic church in, in, in Bangor that will be, and is today, St. John's. And supposedly, uh, at least from a source that's been dealing with the St. John School, it, first the Bishop of Boston comes to speak at the dedication of that church. And the second thing is, supposedly the uh, bloody uh, uh, hat and certain other things and feathers of, uh, of Father Baps's uh, uh, apparel are, were placed in, the, in, a, in, a, uh, in a jar in the, in the cornerstone of, the, of that church. Somewhere around 1860 or 61, he's transferred to Boston, where, as I mentioned, he's the president of Boston College. In 1868 or 9, following some brief service in Providence, in 1868 or 9, which would be when he's about 52 or 3, uh, he becomes uh, the, the, the onset of emotional and other troubles come, uh, such that he is retired to a Jesuit a retirement home in Maryland, where he lives another 17 years, becoming extremely mentally uh, disturbed. Supposedly, in his last years, you, they're coming for me, you know, that kind of thing. That uh, the effects of that attack were so substantial, um, and so on. Yes, Mayor Shirley. Uh, you said that uh, Maddox uh, yeah. had some justification for his uh, feeling uh, about the Catholics and, and maybe supporting uh, women's rights. And, yeah. and well, what was that justification? Well, what, what I the, the thing that I truly believe. I don't know that it's. That, you know, there are other things probably involved. But in his writing about the, in, in the Ellsworth situation, he is arguing, as other know-nothings are, like William Cheney, he is <laughs> writing that our politicians, our professional people, our business leaders are selling out to the Irish Catholic community and the priests. In the process, they are stepping away from the traditional 
George Washington man at the Republican, I don't mean Republican Party, but the traditional uh, heritage of America that we've always lived under. The argument being from his view, and again, it's a propaganda-laden view, uh, that the view is that a Roman church with a Roman hierarchy are sending directions into little main communities and thus undermining, if you will, local self-government and peoples and the like. What I find fascinating in my historical area is that when he goes to New York, his criticism from uh, his criticism of the financial and political community are that once again our favored elites have betrayed us. His view is, in other words, that the, re re the revolutionary heritage of America is sacred, just as the Catholic community undermined that in the pre-Civil War day in the 1870s and 80s. Ulysses Grant, corrupt politicians, business leaders, banking leaders are doing the same thing. I find it fascinating that there's a, I mean, I'm not trying to say it's, it's, lot, it's, it's accurate or it's persuasive, but to me it's interesting that the reasoning he uses, flawed as it may be, to my mind is consistent with his pre-Civil War views. And a similar view being the condition of women, his argument is, is also under, undermined, the freedom of the, of the revolutionary period is undermined by, by the modern conditions in which women are, 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 are uh, uh, are, from his view, uh, limited in, in, in their freedom. Uh, and so, in the study of American history, there's a lot of emphasis now on what is called, not meaning the partisans, but republicanism, the power of that is a moral and intellectual view in the 1780s, 90s, 1800s, 10s, 20s, and Maddox is one of these, uh, in the sense that he argues from a kind of construct of what early American things was. And with a name like George Washington Maddox, you wonder, you know, I just wonder kind of what were the stories maybe that were emanating in his, from his childhood that stuck with him and down the years. So that's why my title, uh, ponderously long, something about George W. Maddox and the peculiar linkage of a nativist uh, uh, and, uh, and the feminist and like, the, the linkage I see is in regard to that philosophy. And, I'm, I'm, the book is coming anyway, so <laughs> okay. thanks much for having me on.